like that. And just before we start off, um, I'm definitely not an expert in this at all. Um, yeah, still definitely still a student. So I know that you both are um, way better at me than at all of this stuff than me. So if I'm speaking nonsense or going off on the wrong track, please do just go ahead and pull me back in. Um, but today we're going to be talking about linear regression. So we've had quite a nice introduction to a couple of the different methods and um, things that we're going to be chatting about in the whole book. Um, and one of the first ones is going to be linear regression. Um, so just the things that we are going to be going over um, in the next week or two. Um, we're first going to look at the simplest form of linear regression, which is with a single predictive variable. Um, and then we're going to see how can we get the standard error of our two regression coefficients. Um, and we're going to see how can we tell how accurate or um, how good our regression line fits. Um, then we're going to move on to multiple linear regression. Um, and we're going to find out how, how do we tell how important each variable is in a multiple linear regression. Um, and then we're going to look at different things that we can do with multiple variables, including things like interaction effects. And we're going to look at how we can introduce qualitative variables um, in a linear regression. Um, and then we're going to look at nonlinear relationships quite quickly. Um, and how would we identify that within a data set? And we're going to compare and contrast that with our k nearest neighbors um, algorithms. So if we have a look at our first section today, we are going back to our favorite data set, the advertising data set, where we had our advertising, and then I think we had our, um, our sales, sorry, and then we had TV, radio, and newspaper, um, different um, advertising budgets. Um, so if we, if we were the statistical consultants for that particular project, um, how, what, what sort of questions would, be answer, would we be asking? Um, so some of the questions could be about the relationship um, either between advertising as a whole and sales or each particular medium um, being associated with sales. And then we can say how strong is that relationship or how large is that particular association? Um, can, we, can we take the information that we have and can we accurately predict future sales? Um, can we infer from what we have um, to get future sales? Um, and then is our relationship even linear? Um, we make a lot of assumptions um, about linear relationships, but maybe it's not even linear. Um, and if it's not, um, then we can't directly use linear regression, um, but we can maybe transform our um, either our predictor or our response so that we can still use a linear regression uh, model. And um, then we're asking maybe do two, do two different predictors um, work um, together? Is there an interaction effect that only is seen when both of those um, predictors are together or not? Um, if we hop on over to our simple linear regression definition, um, from two weeks ago, I think, um, we were looking at um, our general form for how we're going to uh, make, a, make a model. Um, and we were saying that y is equal to some sort of function. Um, and so here we can say our response is approximately modeled um, by two coefficients, our beta zero, which is our intercept, and our beta one, which is our slope. Um, and those are two coefficients or um, parameters, I think we can also call them. Um, and then our x is our single predictive variable for now. Um, so that is our generalized form. And then when we want to um, take it into our sample data set, um, we will make an approximation of each of those um, parameters and then our response. So our approximation and our approximation of intercept and slope rather. Um, have the little hats on them. And then um, we have a prediction, a predicted um, response given um, our observed X variable. Um, and it's a simple approach to supervised learning. 
And then we looked at our TV, um, the units of dollars, I think, spent on TV versus how many um, units of sales we got. And then we have this least squares line. So we fitted a least squares line through this. Um, and then we get all of our different points of the red. And then we can see that we have some, some um, distance between the actual um, least squares line and what our actual point is. And the next thing that we are thinking about is our residual sum of squares. So um, basically what this does, I think we have, there we go. I think we have the formula over here. Um, so if I can quickly get our, yeah. So our residual is our difference between our observed response value and the response value that is predicted by whichever linear model we are trying to fit through that data. Um, so you can add up all of those and square them just to get rid of those um negative or positive because we just care about the um the value not if they're over the line or, or under the line um and then we can square those all up to get our residual sum of squares and then um when we are thinking about our approximations of those two parameters um then we we can th those are those are minimized in our residual sum of squares um, method. Um, so we just have them over here, um, how we would calculate them using um, our sample mean and our observation um, in each of those. And then this is just the written out um, way how to get an actual one residual. So we take our um, response value and we minus our approximated um, intercept and then our approximated slope with our predictor value. And then we got these cool pictures over here. Um, they are our um, visualizations of how we are trying to minimize these two parameters um, to get the smallest possible residual sum of squares because um, that means we are getting all of our points closest as possible to that least squares line. Um, this one was a little bit hard for me to understand, but I think it's just because I haven't worked with those sorts of data before, um, but this one made more sense to me. Um, so if we're looking um, on, the, on the sort of X and, X and Z um, dimensions, we're looking at our two parameters and we can clearly see that at that point, we've got the perfect um, intercept and slope parameters. Um, so that our residual sum of squares is at its lowest point. Um, so that one quite helped me with my understanding. Um, and so that's basically um, simple linear regression um, and how we would calculate a, a residual sum of squares. Um, we then move on to, okay, so if we have our definition, we've got a, um, a value for our intercept coefficient and our slope coefficient, but how can we actually tell whether that's a good, a good coefficient estimate or not? Um, and this is where we bring back in our, um, our error term. So our, um, we're trying to calculate our residual standard error from that um, residual standard, uh, residual sum of squares term. Um, so over here, the, the basically the point of this is to obviously get our error term um, because every single x, x observation has its associated error term. Um, and we want to see are our, are our points um, close to what the true unknown value um, should be. And obviously, because it's unknown, we will never know if it's um, really true. Uh, but we can we can create this thing called our ninety five percent confidence interval, um, which we've done over here. And um, this one's a little bit um, easier to understand, um, at least for me. Um, 
that we take whatever our estimate is for the coefficient and we add or take minus um, two times our standard error um, for that estimate, which we have calculated up here using these two formulas. Um, and 95% confidence intervals, I think, um, is something that everyone has a slightly different definition of. Um, and there's a lot of discourse about it. Um, but here we are defining it as a range of values such that with 95% probability, the range will contain the true unknown value of the parameter. Um, so we're saying if we take repeated samples, so if we take 100 samples and we construct the interval for each of these samples, 95% of those intervals or 95 of those intervals will contain that true unknown value. Um, I just can't see the chat. Awesome. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments or points out to me at any time, please do, um, do let me know. Um, otherwise, let's move on ahead again. Ah, there's one thing that I wanted to point out that I don't think is in these slides. Um, if we hop onto the book. Let me find this. So in the book, they were talking about the definition or the difference rather between the population regression line and the least squares line. So the least squares line is what we were just speaking about um, constructing. Um, and if we have a look at our figure 3.3, um, our red line is the true relationship and our blue line is our least squares, relate, um, least squares model rather. Um, and for a given, given data set, um, we, we wouldn't usually know this population regression line the best linear approximation to the true relationship. Um, but all we can do is try and construct, construct a linear regression, such as using this least squares method um, in the blue um, to get our values for those intercepts as close to the true, true population regression line as possible. Um, and then they were speaking about how, um, how we can think of it in the same way as um, we don't know our population mean, um, we can only estimate it using our sample mean. Um, so it's like they were saying that they like kind of an analogous in that um, sort of in that sort of way. Um, and they call them unbiased estimators. So I know there's been quite a lot of um, chat about bias and things like that. So an unbiased um, estimator. Um, in this, in this um, context is just saying, again, if we could take a, a large, large number of estimates of um, a mean, um, in this case, or um, the, the least squares coefficients, um, the average would equal um, that exact true unknown mean or true unknown um, coefficient slash parameters. Um, so yeah, so they're saying it does not systematically over or under underestimate the true parameter. Um, so that's just what I wanted to add in there. Um, and then we were talking about our standard error um, that we were talking about in our slides. Um, and yeah, we were saying that um, we take our standard deviation, square it and take over our um, sample size to get our mean, our mean standard error, and similar thing that we can do with our standard error of our point estimates. So um, using these two formulae here. Um, and then we can scroll on down. Yes, and we were talking about confidence intervals. Um, so we were saying there's a 95% chance um, that if we take our estimate minus two times the standard error um, and I estimate plus two times the standard error. And then we're also, um, yeah, so um, 
the two is not actually always two. Um, it is our 97.5% quantile of our T distribution with our N minus two degrees of freedom. Um, so that's not, I think, um, please do correct me if I'm wrong, but that's not always two depending on the distributions and things that we use. Um, but please do correct me if I'm wrong there, guys. And then we moved on and said, well, what is the point of this confidence interval? Um, how can this help us? And usually when we're doing a linear regression, we are hypothesis testing. So um, our null hypothesis is usually that there is no relationship between our um, predictive variable or what we're trying to call our predictive variable and our response. Um, and our alternate hypothesis is that there is some relationship between those two, um, those two variables. Um, and basically we're just saying, um, does the slope, is the slope zero or um, does the slope have some sort of um, value? Because we can just reduce that original formula back down to um, if our response can be predicted by just that intercept plus a uh, error term, then X is needed. Um, so X is not associated with that Y term. Um, and then we're saying, okay, well, if we want to say our estimate is far enough from zero that we can be confident that um, our estimate is non-zero, um, we want that interval not to, not to comprise zero. Um, so we compute our T statistic um, using this formula over here. And I'm not, not um, very great. I'm a little bit fuzzy on, on, on the details over here. Um, with how we use our T distribution and things like that. So if anyone wants to jump in and um, give a little bit of a better explanation, um, but basically I just understand that we compute this T statistic um, and we use our N minus two degrees of freedom, which meant that we were using two um, in our confidence interval. Um, and then we have our p-value, um, small p-value, indicates that it's very unlikely to obs observe the association um, purely due to chance um, if there isn't any real association between the predictor and response. So um, if we have a small p-value, a very, very small p-value, we can say that we can reject um, the null hypothesis and say um, there is evidence for a relationship between our predictor and our response. Um, and then we can have our different alpha levels. Sometimes they're 5%, sometimes they're 1%, um, but we're gonna have a look in a further, chop, further chapter about that. Um, then if we hop on back to our slides, um, if we have a think about how can we assess the accuracy of a model, there are two main ways that we can do this um, through our residual standard error um, or RSE um, and our R squared statistic. Um, so if we have a think about our residual standard error, um, because, because each observation has an error term, even if we had our perfect actual regression line, we can never perfectly predict why given some sort of X value. And that's because of that um, irreducible error. So things that we are not accounting for in the model, um, I think if I go up a little bit in my notes. So yeah, we speak about that error term as a catch all term for if the true relationship is not linear, other variables not captured or measurement error. Um, so there is always going to be some error term for each of those observations. Um, and then we can compute this residual standard error um, using as an estimate of the standard deviation of that error term. So um, we can think of that as the average amount that our observed points, our observed observations um, deviate from that true um, regression line. 
um, and it's called a lack of fit of the model. So it's saying, does this model fit very well? How far are those distances um, or um, not? Um, and the reason why it can be a little bit difficult to use is because um, it's measured in units of the response variable. Um, so if we were looking at, um, I don't want to go up too far, but if we're looking at, if we're looking at that, I have it here maybe. Yeah, so if we're looking at this, this um, graph, we would um, compute our RSE in terms of units of sales. Um, and that can be kind of hard to interpret um, because like how, how good is a a certain deviance from the regression line um i think we went into it a little bit in the book over here so yeah so we were saying um if if everything was completely true the unknown coefficients were known exactly um any single prediction of sales would still be off by about 3,260 sale units on average. Um, and then obviously it's got to go down to our context. Like, um, is that a good amount of units to be off? Is our model, maybe, can our model be updated? Maybe we're not capturing all of the information that we have. There might be another variable that's um, affecting this relationship. Um, so you can get the percentage error um, and get it so that because um, our mean value is approximately 14,000, 14, then we take that average value over the total mean and get 23%. But even then, is 23% a good model, a bad model? It all depends on your context. Maybe that's really good in the um, particular field that you're working in or maybe that's really bad and you need like to be within two percent or something like that um, so we also have our second measure um, and that is our r squared statistic um, if i move down a little bit and our r squared is a proportion so um, we are talking about the proportion of the variance explained by the model so it's independent um, of that y response variable scale um, and it will always be be between zero and one um, so if we have a look at our r squared um, we take our total sum of squares minus our residual sum of squares and then we divide by our total sum of squares um, so these two terms trip me up a little bit um, but it was actually explained really nicely in this paragraph um, we were basically saying that our total sum of squares measures all of the variance in our response y. Um, so before we before we perform our regression, that is the total variance um, inherent inherent variance in our response. The book says, um, and then our residual sum of squares, which we calculated a, a few pages up, um, will measure the amount of variability left after performing the regression. So if we take the first number and we minus the second number and we get the amount of variability that has been explained by our analysis. Um, so that can be, um, I don't wanna, yeah, like maybe a better, a better metric for assessing accuracy of our model um, because we're on that zero to one scale, um, we can see, for example, in this particular example, our R squared was um, about 0 0.06, uh, um, 0 0.6, sorry. Um, so just under two thirds of the variability is explained by a linear regression. Um, but again, here also context dependent, um, if that is a good R squared number or not. Um, so the book just went into a little bit more, a um, little bit more detail here. Maybe if you have a biology, psychology or marketing um, application um, you may be content with a lesser r squared value um, but maybe if you're working on some physics 
um, then you need a very, very high R squared value. So let's hop back into the slides. And then we were just looking um, at our R squared um, formula and then our total sum of squares formula. Remember, total sum of squares, um, all of the variability in our response before we've performed that regression. So up until now, we have only been talking about our um, single single variable, single predictive variable, um, should I say. But of course, we can also extend that definition to multiple different predictors. Um, and each of these, each of these beta terms um, is our average effect on our response from that pre predictor variable while holding all others constant. Um, and again, we are minimizing our residual sum of squares. Um, and then if we had a look at our example um, over here, if we had a look at our example, um, we can have a look that our intercept um, is going to be um, 9.3 um, if we're looking at how um, how does does radio affect sales, um, and then um, it will increase by point two um, for every extra unit of radio. Um, and then we're looking at our interaction terms in a second, and then we went into some important questions about this analysis. Um, if we scroll on down a little bit, I think we're going to, there we go. Um, so most of these questions um, boil down to three, three different ideas, um, which is, is there a relationship between our response and predictors? Um, what, are the important or most important variables that capture most of the variability in the data? And how do we fit the best possible model? How well does our model fit our data? Um, so if we jump back into our slides, we can have a look at some of the questions that are going to impact those three different areas. Um, the first question we want to ask when we are dealing with a multiple linear regression is at least one of these predictors um, useful in predicting our response? Because if none of them are useful, um, then just adding more and more and more um, isn't going to increase our models fit to our data. It's not going to really give us any more useful information. Um, so we can look back at our F statistic um, and we know that it's close to one if there's no relationship between a particular um, predictor or not, otherwise it is greater than one. A second question that we can have a look at is, are all of our predictors um, useful or are some of them not really adding any additional information um, to our model? Um, and then we have three three different types of selection um, that we can do to our different variables. Um, they're called forward selection, backward selection, and mixed selection. Um, so if I hop back into the book, we can have a look at those quickly. If I can find that over here. So our forward selection, first of all, um, we begin with a null model. So just our response being predicted by our intercept um, plus our error term. And then um, we fit however many number of simple linear regressions um, and we add the, the lowest, the model that results in the lowest um, residual sum of squares to um, our null model with just the intercept. And then we have a two variable model and we can do 
the same process, same process, same process um, until we've got to some selected stop um, that that we are happy with. Um, and then the complete opposite to that is backward selection. So rather than the null model, we start with all possible variables in our model. And then we remove the variable that has our largest p-value. Um, so our largest p-value, meaning that is the least statistically significant. And then we fit a new model um, with p minus one. Um, so one less than all of the variables. And then we again remove the largest p-value again, again, until some predetermined um, some predetermined stopping rule is reached. Um, so for example, if you have a particular threshold that you want to meet for all of your coefficients, um, you'll have a p-value um, below some threshold. Um, and then we have our mixed selection. Um, so a combination of the previous two types, um, we first perform a forward selection um, and you can continue to do that. Um, but the p-values for the variables um, can, be, can become larger um, as they're added to the model. Um, so if we have, if we add in a variable and we can see that that p-value is too large, again, um, larger than some predetermined threshold, um, we remove that. And that's in essence, our backwards. Um, so it's kind of maybe three steps forward, one back, that sort of thing um, to get to our, um, to get our model that has our specified p-value threshold. Um, and there are of course, different, different pros and cons for each of those methods um, in terms of, you know, computational, um, computational resources needed. Um, backward selection cannot be used if we have more um, predictors than number of observations. Forward selection can always be used. Um, and forward selection, once you've selected a variable, it's always going to be in the model. Um, and maybe you then later add in a predictor that um, explains the variability of a previous predictor, but now you have both of them in, um, so it can become redundant. Um, and then of course, using your mixed selection method, kind of best of both worlds there, adding them forward, um, but then taking one out if you, if you um, reach that, that p-value threshold. And then if we hop back in, we can have a look at how well does the model fit the data. This is um, the same as in our simple linear regression. Um, we can still look at our R squared value, um, giving our proportion of our variance explained, again, TSS minus that RSS, um, and on the scale of zero to one, independent of your response variable units. Um, and then your residual standard error is generalized for our multiple regression using this formula over here. And then if we have a look at all of the different forms of uncertainty um, in a particular prediction, um, there are three main, three main sources of uncertainty within any single prediction. Um, we can have uncertainty in our estimates of our slope and um, intercept, we have model bias, and then we have that irreducible error um, that we can't really do anything about. Next, we can have a look at um, how we can introduce qualitative predictors into a, a model that is quite often used for quantitative predictors, um, and that is through one-hot encoding. Um, so we introduce dummy variables um, that are equal to one, 
Let me see if I can see the chat. Um, do you know any R package to apply any selection strategy? Um, I'm not too sure of one, but um, maybe um, Lucia or Derek has some more ideas there. Um, there are definitely different ways you can select things. Um, I think a little bit we spoke about here um, in model fitting, looking at things like AIC and things like that. Um, but I think we're going to get into those in our lab next week as well. Um, so if anyone else wants to chime in there as well, they can. <laughs> um, so where was I? So we're taking our dummy variables um, and we're basically saying um, in a particular categorical variable, um, we're going to encode it as one when that is true and zero when that is not. And again, um, every coefficient is interpreted um, as an average effect relative to the baseline with um, no predictors in it. Um, and then an alternative to this to this method is to use our indexed variables um, with a different coefficient for each level. So just a different sort of way of looking at introducing qualitative um, qualitative predictive variables in um, rather than just having all quantitative. Then when we're having a look at a multiple linear regression, um, rather than only looking at um, a predictor's, a predictor's um, effect by itself, um, sometimes things affect each other um, only when they're interacting with another variable. Um, so there's an interaction term um, between our x1 and x2 over here. So we, in the, this particular model, um, we are um, incorporating both the effect of our first predictive variable on its own, our second predictable variable on its own, as well as the interaction between those two. And then, because of course, um, not all of our relationships are going to be linear, but we may still want to try and um, have a do a linear regression rather than um, some other nonlinear forms of modeling that we are going to look at. Um, we can try and transform transform our um, predictive variables. Um, here we are taking the square of a partic particular x term. And then what are some potential problems? What are some potential problems um, with using this particular method? Um, the first thing that we were just speaking about is our nonlinear relationships. So we are trying to um, perform a linear regression, uh, but maybe we have got a scatter plot of our data and our data is clearly nonlinear. Um, we may need to fit a transformation. This could be a transformation of our response. This could be a transformation of our predictors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, or this could just be uh, we, after doing that um, and our residuals are still not, um, our residuals are not randomly, um, our residuals aren't random then we are going to probably have to find a different method. Um, and so onto that, um, we are looking at if our error terms are uncorrelated. So we can have a look at different plots. Um, there are quite a few different plots that you can do in R looking at your residuals. Um, and if there's a trend in the residuals, um, that, that is a problem that we need to solve. Um, there could be some sort of time effect, um, but if you can see a clear, you, you shouldn't be able to see a clear trend in your residual plots. Um, and if you do, um, there could be there could be correlations, um, which um, is a problem because one of our assumptions of doing linear regression is that um, their terms are uncorrelated. Um, and if they are, there's some 
there's some other form of variability that we're not capturing in our model. Um, and then again, if we look at our residuals versus fitted values, this is a really nice plot that tells us quite a few um, different things. Um, we can see that the, the variance goes up as our fitted values go up. Um, so there is definitely um, something else going on here. Um, but when we then transform our response here, we're transforming our response, um, we can see that they are much more um, randomly or, yeah, you, we can't see this, this going up so much in our residuals. Um, and then we um, have two, two points um, or two, two terms called outliers and high leverage points. And they're basically the same thing, but on two different axes. Um, so our outliers are points where our um, observed Y, um, our observed response is far from what our model has predicted. Um, and we can detect these by um, plotting our residuals. Um, and a rule of thumb is to look for them larger than three standard residuals. Um, and it can have a dramatic effect on the RSE. Remember the RSE we said um, is in units of the response. So a single outlier, a single outlier can have quite a big um, effect on that overall term and affect that goodness, goodness of fit. Um, and yeah, just um, good things. It could be a mistake. Um, and there are a couple of different ways you can do things with them. Um, but it also could be a genuine, a genuine data point. And maybe your model isn't capturing um, some piece of information that it needs to. And then a high leverage point um, is the same sort of thing. Um, but now we're looking on our predictive variable. So an unusual value of um, our X. So um, if we have a look here, we can see that um, this 41 um, is pulling our slope way up. Um, so high leverage points can have a dramatic effect on our slope um, because um, because if we have a look at that blue dot line, if that's the line of least squares without um, high leverage points, you can see how far that is dragging that line up. Um, and then, of course, that has an effect on all of your different other predictions. Um, and especially if you have a couple of high leverage points that can really affect the model. Um, and we are... Um, encourage to use our leverage statistic to identify those um, because if we have one X and one Y, um, it might be quite easy. Um, but um, if we have more than um, one predictive variable, um, it might be quite hard. So if we plot leverage residuals, we can find those high leverage. And then again, a um, couple of different ways to deal with them depending on um, what you're trying to do. And then the last, the last um, assumption or problem that we can have with our linear regression model is um, collinearity between our predictive variables. Um, so if we have two variables in one model that are closely related to one another, um, we can increase our standard error. Um, and so this could um, this could come into play in our forward selection if we've um, introduced one variable um, and then down the line we introduce a second variable, but they're very closely related to one another. Um, our standard error can go way up, um, and then our p values um, will grow as well. Um, so how to deal with this? You can either remove one of the highly correlated predictors um, or combine them um, into one term or an interaction term or something like that. 
Um, and then we have multicollinearity um, involving three or more predictors. Um, and again, um, anything involving multiple predictors is harder for us to visually identify. Um, so there's this thing called the VIF, the variance inflation factor. Um, and you are checking basically um, the variance of the particular point estimate um, when fitting the entire model um, using all of those um, predictors, um, the ones that have multicollinearity, um, versus how is the variance when you just use that one particular um, predictive variable on its own. Um, so that's, I think, about it for me. Um, these next couple are um, more of the labs. And I think we can have a chat about these um, if you'd like to. Um, I see there's a message in our chat. Awesome. So I can keep on going for a little bit um, if you would like. Otherwise, we can look at these questions next week when we look at the, the exercises as well. Uh, maybe we can look at them now because it's only seven and we have almost eight minutes left. Super. Um, so let us have a look. So basically, we are circling back to the um, beginning of this chapter when we were looking at our advertising, our advertising data set. Um, and we were asking all of those questions about um, relationships, associations, um, predictions of future sales um, and things like that. Um, so if we're asking the first thing, is there a relationship between our advertising budget and our sales? Um, remember our advertising budget um, consists of those three, those three different, um, I can't remember, TV, radio, something else. Um, and if we, if we want to find out, is there a relationship, we're going to look at a multi multiple regression, look at our F statistic. Remember um, our F statistic, if there is a relationship, um, let me just go back before I say the wrong thing. If there is a relationship greater than one um, and it's close to one if there's no relationship. So that's how we would answer the first question. How strong is the relationship um, between our advertising budget and our sales. Um, we can look at our R squared and our RSE. Remember those are the two accuracy metrics that we can look at. Um, R squared being the proportional variance and RSE being the um, lack of fit um, in units of sales in this case. Which media are associated with sales? So we have the three different types of media. Um, we can put them all into a multiple regression and look at the p-values, small p-value, um, likely to be statistically significant, likely to be associated with sales, um, large p-value, unlikely to be associated with the sales. How large is the association between each of those um, media and the sales units? Um, we can look at our confidence intervals on each of those um, on each of those point estimates on those predicted medium. If our confidence interval is um, if our confidence interval is capturing zero, then um, that's not going to be a large association or um, not going to be associated. If it is not, and then it is going to be associated. How accurately can we predict our future sales? Um, we can use prediction intervals for each of those individual responses. Um, so for each individual observation, we're going to have an interval of what we think according to our model is. Um, and then we can around that, around that point, we can compute a confidence interval um, and then maybe give an average an average there. 
um, is our relationship linear? Um, we're going to look at all of those things that we just looked at at potential problems um, and look at all of those different residual plots, leverage, collinearity, all of those good things um, to actually check is our relationship linear? Should we be transforming or should we be using a different model? Um, and then we want to say, do, do um, the different types of media affect each other? Is there synergy? Um, and then we can incorporate an interaction term um, in our model and we can look at associated p-values. Again, small p-value likely to be, um, yes, there is synergy. Um, we should incorporate that into our model. Large p-value, um, probably not, doesn't add anything extra to our understanding of the data. Um, so I can keep on going um, for another three minutes. Um, if we scroll on all the way down, oh, there we go. If we scroll on all the way down, we can compare um, linear, linear regression, um, which is a parametric. Of course, we're working with our parameters um, versus a non-parametric method um, like KNN, um, K nearest neighbors regression. Um, why would we want to do a parametric uh, method? Um, easy to fit, small number of coefficients, um, maybe simple to interpret, um, and they do have tests of statistical significance that can be easily performed. Um, but the reason why we may not want to do a parametric method is because um, they make strong assumptions about um, the form of our function. Um, and again, with all of those potential problems, collinearity, et cetera, et cetera, if um, there's not a linear relationship, if the residuals are correlated, all of those things, um, we will have a poor fitting model to our data. Um, so the reason why we may want to use a KNN, a K nearest neighbors regression, is because it's non-parametric um, and more flexible. Um, I know that um, in a couple of chapters time, we're going to get into a lot more non-parametric methods. Um, but if we scroll down here, um, we are just looking, K is a different number. So it's saying, um, if you have a point, how many points around that point will you be taking into consideration? Um, so this is K is equal to one. Um, and we can see that kind of blocky, um, a, rough, a rough fit. Um, but if we take k is equal to nine, a much smoother fit to the data. Um, and then this is basically saying, if, if our actual function, if the model um, best fitting our data is non-parametric, then um, of course our non-parametric model will outperform it, but our parametric approach will outperform um, the non-parametric approach if it's close to our true form of our function. Um, I don't know if, I think we had another. There we go. So this is our um, KNN regression. Um, and you can see um, this is, this is K is equal to one, very blocky um, fit through our data. Um, and this is K is equal to nine. Um, a, a smoother fit. Um, so basically they're both regression. Um, they're both asking the same thing. So if we have some predictors and we want a response, can we fit a regression line through our data? Um, but KNN does not assume all of those things that linear regression does, um, does not assume linearity of the um, a linear relationship, rather, should I say, um, does not assume all of those things about the residuals um, that can be potential problems um, that we come into in linear models. Um, I think that's about it that I have. If anyone has any further questions, I can try and answer them. We can have a discussion. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a quick inter introduction to linear regression.
Uh, well, no questions from me, but uh, thanks for the great presentation. And also because, because of adding quite more detail than what was shown in the slides from previous cohorts. So thank you for that. No worries, no worries. Okay, so if, if there are no more questions, then at least until now, there is there is no one signed up for the next meeting. Uh, does anyone want to do it? Or it would be the exercise section of this chapter. Um, I don't mind continuing on with it and just finishing this, this linear regression section if no one else wants to. Almost available. Uh, sorry, what? What was the uh, last comment? I didn't get to hear. Uh, Angel. Uh, Angel. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, did you volunteer? Uh, I didn't quite catch that. And you mean... No, I don't see that question. Can you ask me again, please? Uh, uh, I didn't catch your, I didn't listen to your last comment. Could you repeat it? Ah, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. I can also show the exercises ah. for the integration. Okay, so Caroline, would that be okay for you? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so I will add you in the Google Sheets. And that would be it for now. Okay, thank you all for coming. See you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.